I cannot in good conscience allow Mr. Weir to remain a member of the NDP caucus. I'm confident that in this situation, we have responded appropriately and fairly to the claims brought forward. So what the investigator found uh, was that I was sometimes slow to pick up on social cues and that I sat or stood uh, too close to people and engaged them in conversation uh, more than they wished uh, to speak with me. Uh, now that's far from what most Canadians would consider to be sexual harassment. Sexual harassment accusations might be the headline here, but it is not really clear why Aaron Weir was actually kicked out of caucus. Singh says the fact that Weir did not accept responsibility for his actions and then went on to speak to the media after parts of the report were leaked to the CBC was not okay. Weir says the whole process is just deeply flawed. At issue, here to talk about his reaction and more. Andrew Coyne is in Toronto. Chantal Hébert is in Montreal. And Althea Raj is here in Ottawa. Chantal, let's start with you. What do you make of this? It is, first of all, hard to understand what really happened, but of the way it was even handled. It's all very opaque, isn't it? Yes. Uh, and uh, the fault of that, well, to Mr. Weir and to the NDP, because it's very hard to know uh, in this he said, he said, uh, who is really right. But it, the, the major fault over the long term is it's really hard to know, based on that, where the NDP draws the line at acceptable, not acceptable, uh, possibly, possibly, uh, could be redeemed behavior yes. uh, and, and a lot of smoke but uh, really hard to tell what the forest looks like. Althea I guess you were probably on the hill for that and, and have been talking to people what what is your sense of what happened here or whether this is acceptable to caucus the way this has been handled? Caucus seems to be really firmly behind their leader. Uh, unlike the David Christofferson punishment that we talked about uh, a few weeks ago, in this case, nobody had really anything to say, uh, contrary to the party line on uh, Mr. Weir being kicked out of caucus. Uh, it is uh, it's two things I want to say on this front. I actually disagree that it's opaque. I think we have learned a lot more about this process than we have learned about the process involving the Liberals, for example. We have no idea uh, why the the PMO senior staffer, um, Claude Eric Gagné, uh, quit his job and what the nature of the allegations were against him. The Liberal government neighbor really told us what happened to Hunter Tutu and why he was removed from cabinet and caucus. Uh, we were never really told why Mr. Hare uh, it remains in caucus. There are in this case, uh, Mr. Singh came out and said, we have one allegation of harassment, three allegations of sexual harassment. These are the reasons why I'm kicking Mr. Weir out of a caucus. It has actually nothing to do with the report itself, uh, but it has to do with the way he responded to the report. Right. It is, it is unclear to me, though, what the line is here. For, and I think that's Chantal's point for the NDP, Andrew. I, is it you, you can't, because some of the allegations that we heard, anyway, the ones that we know, that he hit on women, and the women rejected him, and then he accepted that. Uh, so I, I am not sure, if they don't give more detail, I am not sure that that is good for the NDP. Yeah, less opaque than the Liberal process is not exactly a high honour. Uh, <laughs> this is still extremely opaque, opaque not just to the public, but, a, but to, to hear Aaron Weir say it, opaque to him. He yes. doesn't know who his accusers are, he doesn't, except maybe in one case, yeah. doesn't know the facts of the cases, so presumably he would be in relatively weak position to offer any kind of defense to the investigator who was uh, collecting the evidence on this, so that's an interesting process. Uh, all we know to, to any detail is what he has said, so the, the actual facts may be much different, maybe much worse, I don't know, but yes, yeah. based on what he has said, uh, the sexual harassment amounted to standing too close to people and uh, not picking up visual, non-visual or visual cues, I should say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, um, if it's that, then I agree with you. A, a lot of people are going to be scratching their heads, saying, um, "It seems like the real crime that got him kicked out of caucus was not uh, taking one for the team, not admitting his guilt, uh, not uh, sort of sucking it up." And if that's the case, then that's kind of an odd situation as well. You should, presumably you should be allowed uh, to disagree with a verdict if you don't think you were justly treated. Chantal. Part uh, of the rationale that we were served was that uh, instead of taking one for the team and being redeemable, uh, Mr. Weir, and he did do, do that, drew a link between his opposition, he's from Saskatchewan, to the notion of a carbon tax uh, and what was happening to him. And 
on that basis uh, was judged to be not redeemable on the rest of the stuff and so kicked out of caucus. But this is a leader that has allowed his, his uh, MPs to go and question his decisions on issues such as how you vote on uh, the attestation that you will respect abortion rights. So at some point, you kind of wonder in this magma of reasons what is happening. The other problem I think that many will have from the outside is that for a long time the line was, and it was pretty clear, that no means no, not just no to it. Uh, the extreme, but just no. Yeah. And the NDP tells us this is an MP uh, who, when told no, got no. Is it? I, I had heard a little bit, Althea, that there, this, there was a, an effort to find a way to get rid of Aaron Weir. Uh, I'm not saying any of this is, is made up, but that they were happy to take an opportunity to, to, to get rid of him. Yeah, I don't know the facts on this case. I do think that... Um, Mr. Weir is a little bit awkward. Uh, I think you kind of saw that in the clip. And it's not surprising to me that there were people who felt um, that he was not picking up on their verbal cues. But yeah. uh, Mr. Singh did know today that, you know, when Mr. Weir asked somebody out, basically, made a romantic gesture and mm -hmm. was turned down, he he let it go. Like, he, yeah. he was not forceful. There was no sense that um, he was aggressive in any way. So. Um, I think, you know, sometimes politics is not only a team sport, but it's also kind of like the popular club at school. And sometimes if you're not in the group, they just don't want to hang out with you. And, and, I, and I would certainly agree that I think from the standpoint of being a team player, we are probably crossed some lines in terms of the way he's reacted to this. Um, but I think the other point I would note, though, is as difficult as we're all finding these issues around sexual harassment, we're getting into even murkier territory, it seems to me, with uh, harassment. Yes. Uh, where and we've seen this now with some of these stories coming out of Newfoundland. Where, what is is it? Crosswords? Is it? Mm -hmm. uh, there was one case where the finance minister in Newfoundland said that harassment was other people having a different point of view and ganging up on her in that respect. Yeah, yeah. Um, we need to get a bit more definition on, on this new territory of harassment without a, that has no sexual component yes, to it. Yes, yes, like disagreeing with someone uh, is not actually bullying. And, I, I hope it's not, because that's the whole newsroom culture. And, and again, <laughs> you know, I, the specifics of any given case, I don't know. We, you know, we, yeah, we're, we're, yeah. We're, we're, again, we're listening to one side or, or the other, but I do think uh, some of the things that I've seen reported, it sure sounds like politics as usual to me. Okay, Chantal, and then I got to move on. Every time I hear about the, this harassment thing, I think back to Lucien Bouchard throwing his cane at one of his staffers. <laughs> yes. Where would again. we be? <laughs> again, not the, again, not the, not the, not the best metric. But, okay, <laughs> quick go around on electoral reform. Andrew, I know that, uh, Andrew, all of you actually love this topic. Andrew, start with you. What did you make of what the government put forward? Well, I can't say I had terribly high expectations, but they managed to come in under them. It's a, it's a bit of a damp squib. It is, as usual with these, with these things, it's very much arranged around the needs of the political parties uh, rather than necessarily the best interest of the public. So, yes, they've warded off, or maybe they have, uh, some of these new menaces to our political process, whether you're talking about foreign money or, or hacking, et cetera. But they sure haven't done a whole lot about some of the old ones, i.e. Uh, robocalling, attack ads, push polls, yeah. Yeah. some of the things we know and hate about the way that our elections are run. And a lot of that is driven by money. Uh, there's too much money in the system, and they really have not, uh, I think, tackled that situation in any kind of comprehensive way. They have, thank goodness, put a cap on how long that election campaign can be so that I won't die in the next one. Althea, what did you make of it? Okay, I totally disagree with Andrew on that. <laughs> Good! Think, um, this is a, if you care and you think that the, gov the government should do all it can to encourage people to vote, uh, this is going to be a bill that you're going to support. Basically, it expands voting to a million plus Canadians living abroad. They are now going to be able to cast a ballot. It makes it easier for Canadian forces serving abroad to be able to vote. It makes it easier for Canadians with disabilities to vote from home. It expands mobile voting. It brings back the voter identification card as a secondary source of uh, proof of where you live. It brings back vouching. All these things that we talked about during mm -hmm. the Fair Elections Act that had critics up in arms. And in many ways, it goes further. It acts on um, the chief electoral officer's recommendations that have been longstanding that no government wanted to bring in. It gives the commission they basically like the police cop of yes. election infractions, the right to compel evidence. Shocking that he didn't have that right. It gives the chief electoral officer the right to demand receipts before political parties get 
in the last election $60 million in taxpayers' money without an ounce of evidence showing that they actually had mm. spent that money that fixes this. And on the robocalls, it actually gives the commissioner the right uh, and the ability to go and look at the phone numbers of the people that called a, a really big gap yeah. and loophole that existed in the Fair Elections Act. Okay, so now, I agree with Andrew. There are things that the government is trying to do in this bill that does they does very poorly. The stuff on uh, you know trying to prevent foreign actors from getting involved in the election process. Mm. I don't know that any government really has the answer in the suggestion. That in the, these bills and this bill are uh, pretty weak, and there are a lot of loopholes. And on the money front. They could have gone a lot further. They didn't. And on the privacy, it's a shell game. It makes it seem like political parties are doing something when there is absolutely no consequences to the action. You have okay. no right to ask the political party what information they have on you. Um, and there's no third party, like an auditor, going to verify whether or not parties are saying are doing what they say they're doing. Okay. I told you Althea liked this topic. Chantal, last word to you. <laughs> oh, uh, it, to me, it sounds more like a lot of remedial stuff and not a lot of forward-thinking stuff. There's something very uh, tentative about it, and right. I find the title electoral reform to be a bit bold, considering <laughs> that it's mostly about nuts and bolts and not reinventing the engine in any way, shape, or form. Right. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. Good news if you want to hear more of us talking about politics. Who wouldn't? At Issue is also a podcast. You get extra content and, of course, uh, the main podcast in uh, podcast form every week. This week on the podcast, is there room for two federal parties for sovereignists in Quebec? The Bloc Québécois seems to be coming apart at the seams. Look for it on iTunes. Any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national.